Aiden. Um, thanks, William, Aiden, for having me. Uh, I think these creative mornings are so, so lovely and a great chance for everyone to get together and talk about something so important uh, before we go about our daily nine to fives. Um, my name is Jackie, and I'm, as Aiden said, one half of a new band called Nouvelle. I normally play with Lauren, but she had to work. Um, I guess it's the downside of playing a gig at what time is it, nine? <laughs> The good side is now the donuts, which I can't wait to get stuck into. Um, I'm going to play a song called Caught Inside, ahead of Anna's talk on equality. Um, I hope you like it. Thanks for listening. morning everyone. Um, so I think we all first experience inequality at a different point in our life 
And when we talk about different subsections of society, it kind of depends where you're placed in society, how strongly those inequalities affect you. So as a young girl, the first time I experienced inequality was when I went to Cornell's Court, which is a shopping centre, and I sat on Santa's lap and I asked for a boy's bag of toys and I was laughed at by the elves and my dad kind of looked at me, you know, really sort of concerned and explained to me there and then that unfortunately, as a girl, I was gonna come up, come up against this constantly over and over again. And even though that's such a kind of juvenile, small example, I think it's there and then that I begun to realize that I was going to be in want of dismantling patriarchal li linguistics and kind of, you know, not for hegemonic maintenance or any of this type of nonsense. Um, the subject that I'm going to talk about today is one that I used to feel so uncomfortable talking about. I used to feel so nervous and I used to feel that it was something that I would never have the language or the capacity or even the courage to speak about. So it's, it feels great to be asked uh, to speak on the issue which is so close to my heart and that is the kind of struggle for women's uh, reproductive rights. I was going to start off with words that aren't actually mine and they kind of struck me because in the 1916 proclamation for kind of the Irish Republic that line about cherishing all children equally always kind of rings in my ear because it's something that we probably all as Irish people could admit just hasn't happened and it's a poem and it's a poem by an amazing uh, poet from Galway and it's called Cherishing for Beginners. And it really encapsulates the inequalities all across Ireland, not just specifically to gender or uh, focusing on kind of reproductive rights. So this is Cherishing for Beginners. Cherish the meek, cherish the ranchers, cherish the guards, cherish the virgins, then ride them and cherish their sisters, cherish tax dodgers and entrepreneurs, Cherish the rewards of intergenerational privilege, or if that's too hard for beginners, then cherish the rose of Tralee. <laughs> cherish the goal and the point and the foul. Cherish the priest's dirty sheets, but not the women who wash them. Don't even mention them or what they might need. Go on, worship the IFSE and, and its brand of laundries. Oh, those ones, they're fine. They're grand, sure, cherish them. Cherish the men because they couldn't help it if the women and girls went and fell pregnant. Cherish the fetus, cherish the heartbeat, but not the human it's in. Then cherish the graves in their undisclosed wastelands. Cherish the shovels and boots that dug them. Let there be no doubt about it. Yes, we can. Cherish dead children if they're from the right class. Don't forget, too, that we must cherish the mute and cherish the sheep, but hate those that are in need. Cherish Father Peter McFerry himself. Go on, make him an icon, but don't hear what he's saying about anything. Cherish the poor for how you can use them to quieten those who are just one rung above. Cherish the people who learned early and often what happens to those with big mouths. Cherish the local TDs and the crowd in Listowel who didn't care that he raped her. Sure, sure wasn't he one of their own. Yeah, cherish the rapist, why don't you? Cherish the golf course and its sprinklers. Sure, Irish water will save us. Cherish piecework and internships and zero-hour contracts. Aren't you lucky to have a job at all? Do you not remember the coffin ships? Are you not grateful at all? Cherish your own exploitation. Cherish the school board for the lack of gay teachers. Cherish women's place in the home. It's written in our constitution. Then cut our allowances. Sure, they don't deserve them. Repeat after me, cherish privatization. And if you don't, then you better learn to cherish the knock on your door in the morning. Consider this a, wor a warning. Cherish Dev and Pierce and blood, blood sacrifice but not what it's for. Don't mention James Connolly, who said that until, until Ireland's women are free, none of us will be. But most of all, cherish outsourcing and remember that your call is important if you too will be cherished equally if you can afford it. 
So that, that was cherishing. But since that's a little bit solemn, I thought I would now move to a game just to kind of get to know your audience because I think it's good to sort of get a feel of the room. So there's like a drinking game called Never Have I Ever. I think <laughs> most of you probably know it, but rather than drink, uh, it would just be great if you kind of raised your hand. So never have I ever lived in a democratic country that has one of the most restrictive draconian abortion laws in the world. Never have I ever lived in a country that the UN Committee uh, on Torture yesterday uh, kind of deemed our laws as deeply troubling. Never have I ever lived in a country where being a woman and being pregnant instantly means you're affected by the Eighth Amendment and all of your bodily autonomy and is stripped away. Never have I ever lived in a country which disproportionately discriminates against impoverished and marginalized women who do not have the freedom or travel or finances to do so. Never have I ever just felt that this has been a decade old fight and that we're at the final hurdle, but that we need everyone in this room and essentially everyone outside of this room to help us to finally bring us to women's kind of liberation. Yay! <laughs> Um, so, uh, I'm Anna, and I'm really thrilled, as I said, to be asked to, to speak today. I know I have my clicker, which I'll just get going. Uh, the first slide that I'm showing is um, the abortion rights campaign. Yeah, so I was just going to say, if you're tweeting or want to get involved wider with the movement, definitely check out ARC. They're at Free Safe Legal on Twitter. So I was trying to think back to uh, the first time that I thought about abortion. And it was before I would have been able to understand truly what it meant. And that's the thing that makes me really, really angered about this issue, about the kind of subversive, subliminal messaging that happens to us before we have an ability uh, to kind of formulate our own opinions. So that, that was me then. And <laughs> I, remember, I remember really well making my communion. And it's that moment when I imagine young girls looking around a church and seeing no, no women, no female religious iconography, or coming to understand that there aren't any women that can hold any positions of power in an institution that they're now learning their kind of educational, um, they're learning their education through. And it was actually this, this age when I, sorry if this is a bit triggering, but it's, it's, it's what's kind of shown all the time. It was around this age when I was at a friend's house and as you do at a sleepover, we were saying the rosary and we're about na <laughs> Yeah, H had my little rosary beads. I was holding them onto them strong. And uh, I was about nine Hail Marys in and I got handed, I got handed one of those leaflets and it was far, far worse than that. And it said, protect the life of the unborn. And I remember like looking around my friend's house, which had candles and you know the, the Virgin Mary and just getting so upset and feeling so unnerved and going home. And yet again, my dad saying something a little bit cryptic and something I wouldn't understand that these people think differently to how we do. But that's very conflicting as a young person. If you go into school, and no one else agrees uh, with, say, what your, what your family thinks. So you, you again, you kind of sub, sub, suppress those feelings. And I think that's, that's the mass inequality in Ireland, is that these images are just placarded all over, all over the place with no kind of accountability. And it just makes me feel deeply kind of sick to my stomach that if, I was that girl in the communion dress not so long ago, and I found myself in a crisis pregnancy situation. That institution would have said, tough luck, we're gonna enslave you, and you're gonna have to work for us, and should you give birth, we're gonna kidnap your child, force it for adoption, and we'll probably never really ever apologize to you or to, to any of your family. Um, I'm just, yeah, so, Standing outside, I'm just kind of going through the kind of timeline of what made me want to set up repeal, was um, I was holding a candle outside the vigil for Savita, who was a woman who kind of needlessly died. And I remember going back to my room in college uh, that night, and 
that year I had been looking at different birthing practices across the world and I'd been looking at matriarchal societies in different parts of Africa. And again, my privilege had kind of blinded me uh, to the inequalities that Irish women were facing. I had never really looked at HSC reports or looked at AIMS or looked at any of these groups that were advocating for women on my doorsteps or essentially advocating for me if I would find myself in a crisis pregnancy situation. So it was that kind of moment when the word equality really sort of hit me in the face because all the reading that I was doing or all the things I said I stood for didn't mean too much if I had never really just kind of stepped outside of myself. And that's something I'd say to all of us, is that we have to look outside of ourselves because the struggles that we face as people who might be lucky enough to be privileged are far worse. And when I'm speaking here today, I'm even thinking of the women or the men that aren't in the room because they can't be. And they're the ones that we really, really should try and speak up and speak out for. So I suppose I have that quote because, you know, these are some of the words that would have been uttered in, in, in the hospital room before Savita would have passed away. And they're the words that I'm constantly reminded by when I think of the struggles that we're now facing and kind of the institutions um, that we're up against. So fast forward to uh, kind of a few years ago, um, I was on a program with a group of um, young migrants and people from diverse backgrounds. And I'd ne never met someone that had been in direct provision. I had read about it, but I didn't really understand it. So this is Abdul, and he'd be someone who I would say he had faced insurmountable obstacles and a lot of inequalities in his life. So he had to flee Somalia uh, when he was 16 as an unaccompanied minor, as, as many people that have to come to Ireland do. And he was living in direct provision, uh, completely alone, really, really isolating. And although Ireland gave him a really tough time, he, with all of his extra time, because he wasn't allowed to work, um, he ended up in, in and out of school, but he used to start volunteering. And I think it's that idea of the kind of selfless act where things mightn't be the best for you, but when you begin to look outside of yourself, the return is kind of um, unquantifiable. But I was thrilled when I started Repeal that I turned to Abdul and we had conversations about women that he had lived and grown up with in direct provision. Because again, I had never been in contact with these women. And that's when I truly kind of understood some of the gross inequalities and just why I wanted to ensure that although Repeal Project, as in putting a word in a jumper, is a very liberal moderate form of activism. It's not something that kind of took me a massive leap, leap of faith, that it's kind of the smaller, more invisible work behind the scenes that takes much longer. But um, yeah, and then I wanted to make sure when I started a Repeal Project that I had actually met with women who themselves had made that journey and to try and garner a, a deeper understanding as to whether it would actually make a difference to them. Because if I ultimately wanted to bring the issue of abortion into the public conscious, if I was doing someone that kind of maybe insulted or didn't hold resonance with someone who made that journey, I probably would have stopped. But Tara was one of the kind of first uh, women in the public eye in Ireland anyway that I'd heard sharing her story. And I remember her saying that when she shared it in Amnesty, it was like kind of a, a pin dropping and she could feel this like collective sigh and uh, release that all of these women, maybe who themselves hadn't traveled, just said, you know, like, thank you. And so I feel for women like Tara who have faced kind of absolutely vitriolic daily onslaughts for sharing their truth uh, that we know so much to, that we owe us kind of so much to. So I suppose, thank you. Thank you, Tara. Um, next, I just wanted to talk. The reason I'm showing all these people is because I think in activism or in anything that you do, there's kind of experiences and people that are really pivotal in kind of shaping uh, how you view the world. And I definitely owe uh, so much to Tara, to Abdul, to my communion dress, <laughs> to, the, to the guy who 
or the man who campaigns against me, who handed me that image, image when I'm nine. And so this is uh, Lynn Ruan and her daughter, Jordan. And so Lynn fell pregnant uh, when she was uh, 15, kind of unexpectedly. And I remember asking her about that time. And I think, not that any one, any one person's life is a blueprint for a narrative, but I think it's just really interesting to understand when we're talking about equality, that we have to be empathetic towards people who haven't had the same education as us, or who have never had to ask themselves the questions kind of about abortion. So Lynn uh, you know, would have told me that at that time, she actually didn't really know what the, what the contraceptive pill was, or that she was of course pro-life, because the only images she had ever been given were, were those ones that I showed earlier. And when I met with her daughter, to uh, help give her a deeper understanding of repeal. She kind of looked me in the eyes and just said, you need to make sure that before other people get to working class areas, that you open up the conversation to women uh, in my community. So that's something I certainly uh, feel a duty to because that's the whole thing uh, about the whole struggle for reproductive rights and the whole hypocrisy about uh, the Eighth Amendment. Is it really, really, uh, discriminates against women who are less fortunate, fortunate than us, that don't have the finances or don't have uh, the agency, agency to do so. Um, I wanted to talk yeah, a little bit about this image, which was really strange at the time when it happened. Um, I remember as a youngster just being so disenfranchised by Irish politics and I think it's quite easy for young people to feel so ap apathetic to processes that you feel really, really haven't served you. And I remember the reason I, I started Repeal was out of restlessness. It was my articulation of frustration at the dominant political narrative. And I would consider activism in terms apolitical, but then anything that's trying to push a status quo, that the control, you know, kind of lies in, inside government buildings, it naturally becomes political. And although I mightn't at the time have been aligned with, a, with that party, I think when you are a woman, any woman, facing mass inequality and essentially you're drowning and someone throws you a life raft, you, you better bet that you're going to get in that life raft and just go, go with them. So I thought as, as, a, as a kind of a, 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 a stance or a kind of a symbolic moment, I thought that was quite important. And I think it's amazing to note that now Breed Smith, who's kind of in the middle in the front row, is now the first TD to public, publicly share her personal story with abortion. So I think, so I think that's really amazing. Um, yeah, before I kind of wrap up, what I wanted to say is, I know I'm in such a, a warm room, I was kind of watching everyone come in and you're like a little bit nervous because um, recently if I'm speaking and someone mightn't agree with me, there's the odd kind of heckle or you can see the sort of sigh. But this, today I just wanted to say that as an Irish woman, it can feel very oppressive sometimes that this fight is, is still ongoing that there's all of these outside forces, and I'm so new to this, this is the thing, this is like a, a you know, a kind of a century old fight, and sometimes it, it can get very, very tiring, but this is the key change, Ireland, or the people of Ireland, when given factual information and actually uh, kind of being welcomed into the narrative of the lived experiences of women, by and large, usually, bar the extremists, actually change their mind. And this was really evident uh, in the Citizens' Assembly, a process which I would have probably completely uh, pushed aside, but it just proved a point. So I'd say to anyone that thinks uh, that they want to get on board, that there are so many ways. There's like a coalition of over 90 organizations that are all working to repeal the eighth. So I would say, yeah, not to get disenfranchised and it is unbelievable with the kind of 
proliferation of social media, how equality issues now, people can instantaneously react. So if we look at kind of online petitions, when we saw that the Sisters of Charity were gonna take over the hospital, you know, a petition in a matter of a week had over 100,000 uh, signatures. So for anyone that thinks their voice is in any way kind of not welcomed, I just urge you, yeah, urge you to kind of join, join the movement. And yeah, thanks.